Thank you for the organizer for, for inviting me. And so I guess there's a change of topic with respect to the previous talks that we had today. So um, I will talk about uh, neural networks and in particular I will focus on the training of a neural network. And uh, I will relate this with uh, the geometry of a neural network, which is a topic in information geometry which has been studied starting probably from the 90s, I would say. So um, I know the audience is very variegated. So in the first part of my um, of my presentation, I will introduce neural networks and different topology of neural network. Then I will talk about Riemannian optimization, which is uh, um, solving an optimization problem defined over a manifold. So I know you, you know about manifold. Uh, I'm not sure if you know about Riemannian optimization, because it's like a kind of specific topic. Then I will mention information geometry and the geometric description that we will introduce in order to motivate the use of Riemannian method in uh, in the training of a neural network, and then I will mention about some possible application to the training of, uh, of a neural network. Uh, okay, so I will. Uh, I really like this quotation is um, from Poincaré and says that uh, basically there is no one true geometry, and we know this. Uh, people in physics know this, even if my background is not uh, in physics. So the idea here is that uh, uh, there could be some choices of different geometries for the space in which we do optimization, which may be convenient. And this depends on the application and depends on the purpose of what you want to do. So this will be like the, the idea behind uh, the talk that we will see here. Okay, so in the first part, we'll talk about neural networks. Neural networks have been around for many years. Uh, they are like, um, um, I mean, the first works on the topic are in the 50s, in the 60s. Now, then there have been like some periods in which they were quite popular in the machine learning community. Then some other periods, they were not popular. At the moment, they are very popular. In the last five years, uh, and uh, somehow the rebranding of deep learning, people uh, worked a lot on these topics. Uh, and uh, this was motivated by the fact that uh, uh, in some specific application, in computer vision, in natural language processing, we are able with these techniques to reach state-of-the-art uh, performance in many different fields. So the topic is of interest. Uh, but the research on these topics started many years ago. And in particular, the research on, uh, on the geometry of neural networks started with the work of Amari in the late of the 90s, or in the middle of the 90s. So what are neural networks? Um, I, I guess you may be familiar with the term. Um, so a neural network is a computational model. Okay, so um, you can see this uh, uh, as a function approximator. So of course there are many different topologies that I will mention later on, but uh, you can see this as uh, like some kind of uh, um, set of units or nodes which somehow interact, and this interaction takes uh, some inspiration from biological networks, but of course they are very different. And uh, in general, they implement uh, nonlinear function approximators. So you can use this for regression problem. You can use this for uh, generative problems in which you want to learn some probability distribution of a sample. I will mention you some application later on. And also will mention you different topology. Because neural network is an umbrella term which includes many different architecture and many different things. And you can do different things based on, on what you are, uh, uh, on the topology that you are using. So, uh, as I said, they have application in, uh, in uh, machine learning for uh, estimation problems, for inference. Uh, you can classify points. Uh, you can do regression. You can also do optimization with some of these architectures. And um, the term deep learning, which appeared uh, in the last, uh, let's say, five to 10 years, somehow, uh, so some people consider this a rebranding, but the idea is that uh, uh, it includes, again, a set of different techniques in which the um, the focus is on creating deep architectures. So deep architectures, and I will tell you, and you will see in the next slides, refers to how many layers or how many like uh, passages you have in this computational graph. So why uh, these techniques became popular? They became popular because of, again, maybe for the third time, because of the fact that uh, recently we can use very large data sets. So we have a huge amount of data that we can use uh, in the training of these systems. And of course, we can also take a, um, like advantage of uh, uh, parallel computational architectures, which are implemented in graphical cars, which allow us to do computation in parallel when you have to work with matrices. And this gave uh, uh, like a lot of speed up in the training phase of these systems. For example, like you can, things which can be trained like in a month now can be trained in half a day, just to give you uh, an idea. 
Okay, so um, as I said at the beginning, there are different types of networks. So uh, you can, one possibility, of course there are many different ways in which you can classify this typology of networks. One way is about the fact of the network being directed or undirected. So you have to think about having nodes and um, connection between nodes. And in the case of an indirect graphical model, probably the most uh, uh, well-known architecture for a neural network is uh, the Boltzmann machine or restricted Boltzmann machine in which you have uh, units here or nodes, like, like in a graphical model, which are associated, for example, to random variable. And one possible application for these models is uh, uh, like a generative model. So, for example, you have some kind of uh, a sample of data, like images, and you would like to, to capture the probability distribution behind the images in order to be able for sam to sample from the model and, for example, generate the images which are similar to the image that you have been seeing. This is like a typical application for this type of model. Then on the other side, we have what are usually referred to feed-forward neural networks, which are directed graph. So these are computational graph. So we have an ordering in these edges, and we have like a layer, a set of nodes, which corresponds to the input. So you somehow, as in a function, give as input some observation, and each node corresponds to a variable. Then you have some processes in the middle, and then you have outputs, which could be, for example, um, like the label of an object, the probability of the label of the object, which has been given as input, or you can have like some value for a regression problem, for example. So the two architectures are very different. One is uh, basically a computational graph, and I will talk to you about the list later on. And this, the first one is uh, instead just like a, um, a random, uh, random graph, or like a, a Markov random field, for example, for those of you who are familiar with this. Okay, so let me spend a few words about the uh, Boston machine, and then I will focus on training of these models. So Boston machine have been introduced uh, like uh, by Hilton and co-workers in the 80s. Um, so if you think about a Mozart machine, you can think as a, a Markov random field. So we have a node, each node is a random variable. You have connection between uh, these nodes and uh, um, you can associate a probability distribution to this graph. And you know that the lack of a connection between edges has some statistical interpretation. And basically, it refers to some kind of conditional independence given the um, the neighborhood of the two nodes. So we have an association between probability distribution, the way the probability distribution factorizes, and the topology of this graph. So these uh, undirected graphs uh, are well studied in the literature of graphical models, for example. So when we talk about uh, uh, this type of graph, usually we can distinguish between uh, visible units and the hidden units. So the visible units, for example, are the values of the pixel of an image that you give as an input to this system. And the hidden units are some other variables that you want to model. You may suppose in your model that there are hidden variables that you don't see, but they have like some kind of uh, impact on your, on your probability distribution, like as you do in uh, variational inference, for example. So you introduce a latent variable and uh, um, you say that the latent variable somehow, uh, based on the value of the latent variables, your visible variables uh, are, takes different values. And then what you do is that uh, you introduce a bottom distribution over this graph, and the bottom distribution is defined by some parameters, which basically are the weight that you associate to the, to the connection of the graph. So I mentioned bottom machine because, uh, uh, sorry, I mentioned restricted bottom machine, and uh, this will have some constraints on the way in which we do the connection between the units. But before we do this, well, you are very familiar with the energy function in, the, in physics, and um, what we want to do is to introduce energy function, which is a function of the value uh, of uh, our states, based on some parameter value, for example. Then we introduce a joint Gibbs distribution over our graph, uh, uh, with the, the typical uh, Boston distribution here, in which we take the energy values and we have this uh, partition function in order to normalize uh, our probabilities. Of course, when we work with this model here, we know that uh, if we want to sample, for example, this model, which is one of the things that you want to do with a generative model, because you want to generate new samples which look like to, like to be distributed with respect to a probability distribution that you have learned from data, you have the problem that you don't have an easy way to sample because, uh, uh, easy computationally speaking, because the partition function requires a summation over all the instances, and so it's not something that you can easily handle. So, uh, so people worked on a restricted Boston machine. They introduced a restricted Boston machine, which are like uh, as Boston machine, but you have some kind of uh, uh, 
constraints on the connection that you have in your graph. So basically, you can distinguish between, as I said, the visible nodes and hidden uh, uh, visible and hidden uh, nodes, and you suppose that you don't have connection between uh, the hidden and you don't have connection between the visible units. So this is like uh, an assumption of conditional independence, which means that if I fix uh, the values of the variable in one of the two layers, all the other variables are independent, one from the other, given the variables uh, to which they are connected. So we have a statistical interpretation here, because we're using the language of graphical model. Well, under this hypothesis, then uh, we have like, uh, uh, of course, we can rewrite our energy function in which the connection that we have are only between visible and hidden, so all the coefficients between uh, variables of the same type are zero. And then the advantage here is that, uh, given, that we have, given that we have this uh, conditional independence assumption, if you write the formula of the conditional probability of each of the visible variables or each of the hidden variable, the conditional probability when you fix what you have in the other layer becomes something which does not have any more the partition function. So it's easy to compute the value of this probability. And this is basically what you do when you have the Gibbs sampler. So you fix all the variables of a neighborhood of a variable, and then you evaluate the probability of that variable to be plus one or minus one, for example, and then you sample from this variable. So the reason why people introduce the restricted Boston machine is because they provide an easy way to sample from uh, these uh, models, for example, but also for some other reasons which are related to the training. So how do we train this system? So first of all, what do we mean by training? Training means that, uh, of course, uh, we start with the, some uh, observation, a sample, like uh, a training set. You can think about, for example, image, which have been given to you. The purpose is to learn some kind of model which is able to generate images similar to the one that we, um, uh, that we have in input. By similar, it means, for example, that when you see the image, you're not able to distinguish whether the image was or not in the training set which is given, given to you. And uh, the training means that basically you want to learn the weights in the, your energy function such that uh, um, when you sample from the model, then you obtain something which is reasonable. And this training, so training means basically to learn the probabilities and basically to learn the value of these weights because our probabilities are like in a parametric model. So the weights define the probability distribution. So in this model here, uh, what people propose in the literature, and this was a work by Hinton, which is one of the, uh, the persons who's been working uh, more, most with the, this type of models, you have like some formula in which uh, uh, you do optimization based on the uh, maximization of the likelihood. So you want to model to maximize the likelihood as you would do, for example, in some statistical problem. And then you compute the derivative of this, mo of this uh, quantity, the likelihood. You want to maximize the likelihood and you obtain like some formula which based on the structure that we have in our topology, they do not depend, for example, on the, um, on the partition function. And so they can be somehow computed uh, easily. And, uh, and then uh, you implement just a gradient descent technique in which you keep on updating your parameters in the direction of the gradient until you, you decide that you want to stop because you have some kind of convergence which may depend on, uh, um, on some criterion, for example, after a certain amount of iteration. Okay, so basically we have <clears throat> models which uh, are based on uh, uh, graphical models. So we have a strong theory which tells us uh, how does the joint probability, joint probability distribution of the model looks like so based on the topology of the graph. Uh, we have an energy function which is defined by the weights and uh, we have a quantity which we want to maximize during training. And then once we have done, we have done that, we use the model to sample and uh, for example to obtain images or some other data uh, similar to the one used in the training. Yes? Yes. What do you do with the hidden variables? These are as the input for, for learning. So you, you don't observe hidden variables. So somehow they are estimated implicitly, and uh, um, the, the learning is only based on the data that you observe. So in, in a sense, uh, this is as when you have like uh, some hidden variables, uh, you, you, the learning of the hidden variables is a consequence of the fact that you suppose that the model is there, but, uh, and it has this shape in which the hidden, hidden variable play a role, but uh, you, you don't uh, input the hidden variables. Yeah, in that sense, you should obtain W as a function of the hidden variable. Uh, w? 
So in the, in the pr procedure of the training, you fix uh, one layer at a time, and you sample based on the you sample the values the values of uh, uh, of the hidden or of the uh, observed variables based on the value of the variables in the hidden or in the other so you exchange the two and uh, you, you never give as input to the hidden because you don't have them so you start the procedure as giving as input to the uh, the observed variables and the weights uh, the weights do not depend on the on the hidden variables is the, the hidden variable depends on the weights. Mm -hmm. in, this, in this condition, you have the Ws and you have the Hs. So I guess that if you actually want a value for the Ws, you have to input something for the Sorry, Hs. can you repeat the last part? You have, you have this optimality equation. Uh -huh. where, like the, the derivative of log P equals this quantity. And uh -huh. So I guess I'm taking the expectation value over the Hs. I'm taking expectation over the Hs. Uh, with respect to the distribution exactly. of the previous step, so you begin with an a priori distribution in the first zero. So I think what's not clear here is that you are taking the expectation based on the right hand side. Yeah, so uh, I w when I compute the marginal, I average over all the possible of uh, values of the hidden. And here, this uh, uh, notation here takes, uh, means that I have like some uh, expected values of uh, this quantity here, based on the data that I observe, so I take an average, or based on what I would expect from the model itself given the value of the Ws. So maybe we can maybe go more and discuss about this later on, okay? Okay, uh, so what about the feed-forward structures? So now we move to the other large uh, family of networks. So this uh, uh, have been proposed uh, well, the first work on the unit, which is at the basis of this network, uh, is known as the perceptron from, from the 50s, but uh, other people who worked on these topics later on. The idea is that uh, here we have uh, um, a model which is different because we have connections. So we have explicitly what are the inputs of our model, which are like the observed variables, and then we have outputs, which are uh, uh, some quantity that we want to estimate uh, from the input variables. And they can be, for example, probabilities, uh, if you do cl uh, classification, or they can be like some, some variables that depend uh, on the observed variables, like, uh, for example, in a regression problem. And uh, our model is done in the following way. So uh, we have uh, each unit here, which process uh, the input, which is given by a linear combination of the nodes that enter the input uh, from the previous layer. So we have a sequence of layers. This is the input layer, and then we have our units, and then we have the output. And uh, the units process the information as uh, a nonlinear function, which has as argument this linear combination, which is a linear combination of the x in this case. So this is a very simple model. It has been used uh, for classification purposes. And indeed, if you uh, now, <clears throat> Of course, here I didn't specify what kind of uh, nonlinear function I, I have. Usually, this is called activation function and has some property as being, for example, monotonic increasing. We can consider, in particular, to the case in which uh, uh, our activation function is uh, a threshold function for, for negative value of the argument is zero and for positive value it is one. And uh, now, if you look at this object, so the perceptron, this works as a uh, as a classifier, as a linear classifier, because we take a linear combination of the weights and uh, we assign the output to be one if it is positive or a zero if it is negative. So basically, we are uh, we have an hyperplane in our space of the x, and if the inner product between the the, uh, the x and the normal to the hyperplane is positive, we have a label. Otherwise, we have the other label. So it's a very simple model. It's a classification. Uh, it's, it's a model used for classification in which the weights define the decision hyperplane. And of course, it's able to learn only things which are linear separable because uh, uh, we have an hyperplane in our space. But what happens when we compose this structure, for example, with uh, like uh, different layers in which each of these uh, nodes here and these units acts as a perceptron? And uh, at each layer, we take as input a linear combination of the output of the previous layer. 
then we can obtain an object which shows some nonlinear behavior. So for example, uh, here I have like a, a very simple structure in which uh, um, you plot the decision boundaries of the class for a binary classification problem to be zero and one, and you see that we can learn some nonlinear boundaries based on the fact that our model here is nonlinear given by the sequence of uh, uh, nonlinear activation that we have, nonlinear activation that we have in our model. So, of course, we can write an explicit formula for the output because the output of the nectar, which is given by y, is just like a composition of functions. So you start from the input, you multiply by some weights, and you obtain a vector of values, and then this goes uh, to input to the nonlinear function, which produces an output. Again, you apply some linear transformation uh, with respect to the weights, and so on. So we have an explicit formula. This formula is very nonlinear, so it's uh, very difficult to understand exactly what is happening because we don't have clearly hyperplanes. But what we know is that uh, uh, this will map an x to a value of y. Okay. So I mentioned at the beginning uh, the fact that now we talk about this architecture using the term deep learning. So the, the, the term deep refers to the fact that uh, we can add an arbitrary number of uh, layers in the hidden units. And this uh, creates uh, objects which are very nonlinear or that are difficult to predict what they do in general because the analysis becomes very complicated. But there is no limit to, to this uh, number of layers. So you can have a very, very deep architecture in this uh, context here. OK, so uh, in the previous case, the weights were defining uh, the energy function. And so they were defining some bosom distribution over the states of my graphical model. Here, I have something different <clears throat> in the sense that my weights, they define a function. So I can think about the weights, uh, like I can think about a parameter space for the weights, which in this case here is r in the sense, r to the n, in the sense that we didn't put any constraint on the weights at the moment. And I can associate to each assignment of the weights some function which takes input and generate output. What is interesting here is that uh, we don't have a unique parameterization using what we have written here. So there could be that the two assignments of the weights, they generate the same function. And this is very easy to see because if you look at the previous slide, you can think about like uh, swapping these two internal nodes. So there will be like some permutation of the corresponding weights in the, uh, of the connection between the input layer and the node and between the node and the output layer. And this generates some symmetries here such that the different assignment of W are exactly represent the same function because we have a graph in which some operations are running parallel. This is basically the motivation. So how do we do training? Of course, uh, what kind of problem we want to solve? Now we want to solve, for example, a classification problem. So we give the image that we have uh, previously from uh, the other task. And instead of uh, trying to generate other images similar to that one, we want to predict what is represented in the image. Like, uh, for example, if it is a cat, if it is a dog, or these kind of things. So. Um, how we do, uh, or instead we can give as input some uh, uh, vector of features and we want to predict the value of some dependent variable. Um, so how do we train? Again, we have to define some cost function for classification task uh, where we could think about the likelihood of our data. Um, for uh, regression task, we can think about some loss function which is, could be, for example, the square loss, so the difference between what I have in my labels during training and the prediction done by my network. And then once I have this loss function, what I want to do basically is to minimize a quantity which depends on the data that I have in my training set. So when I train a neural network, and generally when I train a, a machine learning system, I have some data which, like, from which I want to take uh, information. For example, uh, I want to train my system based on this data. And so I will use this data, for example, or part of this data, to define uh, this empirical risk, which corresponds to the function, my cost function, that I will minimize during my, uh, my training. So training corresponds to an optimization problem, basically. So again, I could think about implementing uh, the most uh, simplest thing you can do when you have this type of models. So, so first of all, the function that we want to minimize is, uh, uh, is very nonlinear. So we are talking about non-convex optimization. It's very high dimensional because this network can be very large. And so uh, we want to solve a problem in which uh, uh, gradient descent usually is a, a good approach because of this uh, condition here. So we will have just an updating rule in which you compute the gradient of our cost function, and then we updated the weights of the network in that direction. 
This can be done in many techniques. I don't want to spend too much time now on this, but the idea is that, uh, uh, of course, there is a huge literature on the topic. You can introduce some mo momentum term. You can uh, have like uh, uh, this gradient computed with respect to a subset of the points when you do your iteration. So there are many, many techniques that you can apply. The point is that, of course, this is a technique that uh, will most likely converge to some local minima. And uh, being this uh, gradient, it will uh, slow down in presence of plateau, where the gradient will become close to zero. So uh, you have a lot of literature, as I said, in order to try to face this technique using like many, many different uh, type of approaches. Uh, what I care here is that, of course, the landscape of this function is a function of the topology of the network and is a function of the problem itself. So given a specific problem, you will, there is a problem that I didn't mention here, which is basically a model selection problem, which you have to choose what kind of, the complexity of your model in terms of uh, uh, like the number of units that you have in your network, the number of layers and so on. So uh, of course, there's, there's a lot of, of literature behind this. Okay, so how do you compute the gradient? Uh, so we need to compute the gradient with respect to, we have to compute the gradient with respect to uh, the weights of our network, so the parameters of the network, which are uh, the connection weights. And um, usually we do this uh, using a, te a technique which is called the backpropagation. So this is just like a, um, a kind of um, a shortcut that you have in this context when you have to do with the computational graph. So when you have a computational graph and you want to, so let's go back maybe to this picture here you have to compute the derivative of the loss function, which is a function of uh, the real labels uh, that we have and a function of the output. You have to take the derivative with respect to all these uh, weights that you have here. And uh, you can prove that uh, you don't really need to compute explicitly all the derivatives in the sense that uh, some derivatives are function of other derivatives that you have computed. And so in this context, it becomes uh, uh, like uh, very efficient to use some techniques which are called uh, backpropagation, which provides basically some uh, uh, like um, some simple algorithm in which uh, you have some recursion and in which the computation of the derivative uh, um, is linear in the depth of the network. So you have to compute this for all the weights, but uh, you compute layer by layer and you reuse some information. This comes uh, not, not, not only from the literature of neural network, but also from the literature of uh, control in engineering, in which they had to do with the computational graph, and they proved, I think, in the 50s and the 60s that uh, there exists efficient computation for this kind of, uh, of computation. Okay. So now we have, uh, uh, again, a gradient uh, descent method. And the gradient descent will depend, for example, on the step size and the way in which we computed this gradient. And in general, we know that uh, gradient descent is uh, very easy to be computed, but may have some drawback. In particular, there is a dependence on the parameterization that you use. So when you take the derivative based on the choice of the parameterization, the gradient will be different. There may be a slow convergence in presence of plateau. And the plateau can be given by the function that you want to optimize, but they're also given by the geometry of the space itself. And this is a very important point. And then there may be like some other issue that I will not mention here that in general appear when you want to compute the gradient of some quantity in which the variables somehow are associated to a probability distribution or to the parameters of a probability distribution. This is the typical case in which you may see like dependence on the parameterization and some other issue related to uh, like um, to, the, to the point of being critical, so with the gradient zero in some parts of your, uh, of your domain. So what, what is the idea and uh, what is the role of geometry here? So, so far I gave you like introduction about what are neural networks, the type of problem that we want to solve. Um, I, I, I convinced you that I show you that the training means optimization. And now I want to introduce the geometric part which means that uh, what happens or does it make sense to move from a Euclidean description of the space of the parameters or Euclidean description of the space of the function which are encoded by the neural network to some other kind of geometry. And this is one of the topics studied in, uh, in information geometry. But before we do this, I want to give you like a very short introduction, like a, a few slides on Riemannian optimization. So um, Riemannian optimization is uh, 
uh, like uh, is the optimization that you do when your domain is uh, a known flat object, is, an, is a non Euclidean space, so it has like uh, some uh, like some properties of being curved, or some properties of like being represented. You can represent this in high dimensional subspace, but this is like a low dimensional object, and. Uh, <clears throat> So you know about manifolds, what we care here is the fact that we want to work with the Riemannian manifolds, which introduce a notion of a metric, a metric tensor, which is used to compute the length of a vector, for example. So, um, so why do we know this? Well, we know this because we, we need this because I want to discuss what is the right approach that you should do mathematically when you want to optimize a function in which the domain <coughs> is given by a set of points to which you attach some uh, manifold structure, for example. Well, first of all, manifold optimization and Riemannian manifold optimization has a lot of application, not only in machine learning, but in statistics, physics, algebra, signal processing. And why we want to do this? Well, first of all, because we want to take advantage of some information that we may have about the problem that we want to solve. Maybe the problem has some symmetries, or maybe there are like some invariant properties uh, in, the, in the cost function that we want to optimize, or in uh, the constraint that we have. And then we can take these constraints and uh, uh, like uh, put them in the definition of a manifold itself. So we move from a constrained Euclidean object to something which is uh, uh, intrinsically constrained to being a manifold. And also, this allows us to have a mathematical framework, which, uh, for example, is uh, uh, very suitable for convergent analysis of algorithm in the context of uh, uh, manifolds, which allows you, for example, to obtain results about linear convergence of gradient descent or, uh, uh, subli or um, sublinear convergence of uh, uh, other type of algorithms. So I have a reference here, which is a book on optimization of manifold, which is very good, and you can refer to this. Um, the idea is that uh, provided that we have a manifold, and I will not talk about this, and the manifold has some uh, like uh, nice properties, so we have the possibility to introduce a coordinate chart and all the construction associated to manifold. In order to do first order calculus, which means computed gradients, we needed to introduce a tangent space. And we can do this locally in the sense that each point will have a different tangent space. Um, and also, we need like, to introduce over the tangent space this uh, um, bilinear operator, which is the uh, Riemannian metric, which given basically two vectors, defines like uh, uh, a quadratic form uh, which associates a scalar, which is associated to, uh, to the inner product. Um, this uh, uh, metric here is useful because it can be used to compute the norm of vectors, the length, and uh, in particular, this allows us to compute the length of a curve, and so to compute, for example, the geodetic between uh, two uh, points uh, in the manifold. Being the geodetic, the curves that minimize the length uh, between uh, the two points, uh, where the length is uh, computed in this way, based on the value of, uh, based on the formula that you have for the metric. So manifolds are like a generalization of uh, a Euclidean space in which basically we compute the, uh, the inner product in the usual way that you would do in a, uh, in a Euclidean space. So we we'll skip this slide, it's just an example of uh, uh, the uh, possible like uh, very easy manifold which is given by the sphere in which you have all the explicit formula for the computation of, uh, of gradients, computation of geodetics and so on. So uh, why we care? Uh, well, we care because uh, if we want to introduce a non-Euclidean um, a non-Euclidean geometry over the space of uh, uh, of statistical models to apply this to neural networks, so basically we need to know what is a, a Riemannian gradient. The definition of Riemannian gradients depends on the metric. This is the mathematical formulation here. Basically, is given a vector field over your uh, over your manifold. The gradient is that vector such that the um, the application of the metric between the gradient and any direction gives you the differential derivative of the function for which you want to compute the gradient in the direction given by the vector field. So this is uh, like an um, uh, implicit definition in the sense that it's not parametric. We don't have we didn't introduce and we didn't exploit. Uh, any specific parameterization, so is invariant to the choice of the parameterization, and this goes in the direction of being able to define algorithms that do not depend on the way in which we parameterize the object that we have in our manifold, which is one of the motivation for the invariance that we have in Riemannian optimization. 
So at a certain point, you needed to introduce a parameterization because you want to do computation. So you needed to introduce a chart. The parameterization is the inverse of the chart, which means that your function, which will be a function, generic function of a point in the manifold, now becomes a function that is based on the way in which you decide to represent the point in the manifold using a set of coordinates, for example. And uh, if you solve this equation here, given the fact that you introduce a parameterization, you find that the gradient requires basically uh, to compute the inverse of a matrix, which is associated to uh, the metric. And the gradient has the components, which are the vector or partial derivative, as you would have in Euclidean space, and the inverse of the metric, which is a new term here, that, for example, in the case of Euclidean space, is equal to 1, because it's the, it's the identity, it's not equal to 1, sorry. So it disappears, basically. So now we have a mathematical formulation for the gradient, provided that we attach a specific geometric construction to our, um, to our space. And we know that the, the gradient, so the direction that minimizes some function, uh, the steeper direction for the minimization of a function, has to be computed, taking into account the metric of the space. Notice that the metric depends on the point, so every time the quadratic form will be different, and so you will need to invert a different function. OK, so uh, there is actually another ingredient that we need to introduce, which is the exponential map. The exponential map is a way to map vectors in the tangent space to points in the manifold. And you do this basically by moving along uh, the geodetic such that in the point, the vector is the velocity vector to the curve that you have. And you, knew you need this because if you want to implement some gradient descent technique in Euclidean space, you take the point and you add the gradient. Here, you cannot do that because if you take a point and you add the gradient, these two objects are in different spaces. So we need a way to map uh, like points in this tangent space back to the manifold in order to be able to compute uh, like some uh, iterative algorithm uh, following the direction of the gradient. And then there is a possibility to, of course, in order to compute the geodetic, uh, this can be computationally hard. In general, the definition requires uh, to solve a differential equation in which you fix to zero the acceleration. This is one of the definitions of geodetic. So uh, in, people introduce some other operators, which are some kind of relaxation of the uh, exponential map, which have some constraints up to the first order to behave in a similar way to the retraction. Uh, but in general, there may be more easy to be computed, and so they could be more efficient from a computational perspective. So in general, it's convenient to use retraction instead of exponential map, also because the theory of convergence only requires some condition on the operator that you use, which are first order condition, and these are exactly the condition that you have for the exponential, for the retraction, which means that implementing an algorithm for the retraction allows you to maintain the convergence properties that you have in your algorithm. OK, so this is now uh, first order optimization algorithm that Riemannian gradient. So, uh, well, this was the formula that we use in Euclidean gradient, and we know that uh, this was not working because, uh, uh, of course, you don't have uh, um, a proper way to sum points with vectors. And so you move to a new formula here, in which in each, the new point that you will have in your iterative scheme will be based on the application of uh, the exponential operator in the direction given by the gradient of your function. Or alternatively, as I said, you can use the detraction. So this is a, a very uh, used scheme for optimization, for example, in linear algebra, when you want to optimize uh, over the cone of positive definite matrices, or over the manifold of rank K matrices, over manifold of tensors. So there are many, many applications. And I suggest you, if you're interested, to refer to the book for uh, many examples. OK. So uh, first part was about neural networks, the second part about optimization on a Riemannian space. And now we need to understand how we can put the two things together and why Riemannian optimization is useful in the context of uh, uh, neural network. And this is one of the topics studied in information geometry. So information geometry has been already mentioned here, of course, because it's one of the topics of the conferences. The idea that uh, uh, like the space of probability distribution may admit some geometry different from the Euclidean geometry was probably first remarked by Hotelling and Rao in the 30s and in the 45. Uh, the field uh, well, developed starting from the 80s with the, the work of Amari and other research that I mentioned here. But many other people, and some of them are here in the audience, work on the topics uh, um, like also recently, of course. 
So the idea is that uh, we can use the geometry of statistical models. Well, we can use the differential geometry description of a statistical model, introducing a specific metric in our search space, and describe the geometry based on the language of, uh, uh, of Riemannian geometry. Actually, not only Riemannian geometry, because also other types of geometry have been introduced in the context of information geometry. So we can say, in general, uh, affine geometries or Riemannian geometry, depending on the specific model. Here, I will review uh, like the basic construction, but uh, there's a lot of literature on this topic also. Here, there are like some references to some material. If you're interested, the book of Amari and some other uh, book, uh, more and less recent, which have been uh, uh, published. OK, so I've been talking about uh, gradient descent in the previous, uh, um, in the previous um, section of my presentation. And I told you that, uh, of course, once you have a metric, you can compute the gradient, uh, uh, the gradient with respect to the manifold structure you have by taking the inverse of the quadratic form associated to the metric for a specific parameterization. Here I want to review like a different intuitive construction, which is based on the paper of, of uh, Amari in 1998, in which you obtain the same results. So again, a formula which requires the inversion of the, of the metric and times the vector of partial derivative, but using a more intuitive uh, construction, which is basically the way in which you introduce a geometric construction starting from a KL divergence or from more generic divergence uh, functions. So of course, uh, uh, the idea is that uh, um, we can uh, replace the definition Oh, well, we can give a definition of a gradient in the following way. You take a point, you evaluate your function uh, in a set of points which have a fixed distance from your original point, and then you choose the direction, the vector, in which you minimize, basically, uh, this, uh, the value of the function in the sphere. So you replace the notion of gradient in the following way. I have a function. I evaluated the function in my point plus some delta. And uh, I, uh, I look for the, the, the direction which minimizes this quantity. And for example, I fix the, the norm of this vector to be equal to 1. So if you solve this problem uh, with these constraints here, you have the definition of gradient in a Euclidean space. So what kind of uh, approach we have to do, we have to follow, we can follow if the space is a space of probability distribution. Well, in the space of probability distribution, maybe there are like other functions which play a different role or maybe more interesting in the computation of uh, distances or computation of divergences. And one of them is the KL divergence, of course, which has the advantage of not to be dependent on the specific parameterization choose to represent our probability distribution. And if you replace the constraint of the uh, vector here to be equal to 1 with a constraint such that the KL divergence between the new probability distribution and the original one is of fixed size, this gives you like a different definition of gradient. So remember that here the object in our domain are probability distribution. So when we set this kind of constraints, we are implying that we have a way to compute distances between them. And the choice of the function that you use for the distance defines a different geometry. And this is one of the possible approach to the construction of information geometry. In this plot here, you see, for example, what happens when you have a Gaussian distribution and you fix the KL divergence between neighborhood distribution of our, of our Gaussian distribution and the one that we have in our space to be of a fixed value. So here I have the space of the parameters of a Gaussian distribution, so the mean vector and the variance, and the covariance, sorry. Each point is an, an assignment of the parameters of my uh, Gaussian distribution. And each uh, curve that you see here is the set of probability distribution which have a fixed KL divergence from the one in the middle. And as you can see, this uh, uh, ball here changes in shape uh, based on where I compute it, which means that basically our space has, uh, is stretched in a different way and as a consequence of the specific parameterization that we choose. And if we would reparameterize the Gaussian distribution using different parameters, we would observe different shapes for these uh, uh, for this, uh, curves here. So, of course, we want now to take into account this in the computation of the gradient because we are looking for a point along this curve here, which minimizes the function, the value of the function. And so, basically, we have like a different direction because the, the more, the, the most different from a, a, um, a ball, a perfect sphere, is this curve here. The most different will be the direction of the gradient computed with respect to, to this geometry here, with respect to the Euclidean gradient. 
Okay, so I will skip this derivation here. They are based on some uh, assumption you do, and uh, the final result that you find in the paper of Amar is the following one, in which you have to compute a new gradient, which is again the inverse of some matrix times the vector of partial derivative. So this is a very intuitive way to introduce uh, the gradient which Amari called uh, natural gradient because uh, according to him, this was the most natural thing to do. But uh, you could have like also a more formal uh, uh, framework that I didn't have time to, to discuss here in which you introduce uh, the geometric construction of a manifold. So you start from the chart, you introduce the definition of tangent space, you introduce an inner product of the tangent space. And based on the idea that you compute inner products between random variables as the integral of the product of the two in the point, uh, well, this gives the same definition. So basically, you can obtain, uh, you can derive an exactly geometric construction for the space of probability distribution using uh, the mathematical framework, more formal framework that I have introduced previously. But I decided to skip it because I will not have time for, for everything. So again, this is more intuitive formula, which uh, shows you why it makes sense to do these kind of things if you start with the hypothesis that the geometry is not Euclidean. So what is this matrix I? Well, this matrix I, by definition, is the Fisher information matrix. So <clears throat> now here we use the language of differential geometry applied to statistics, and all the quantities that we will have, they will have interpretation in uh, a statistical interpretation. And the interpretation of the representation of the metric in the quadratic form is that this, by definition, corresponds to the Fisher information matrix. OK. So in this last part of my talk, I want to discuss about the use of this method in training of neural networks. So first of all, um, the, literature is, uh, uh, the literature of the use of Riemannian method is uh, quite uh, large, I would say. Here I will only touch some parts related to neural network. More in general, the literature of the use of Riemannian method for statistical model is even larger. And I will give you some references at the end of the presentation. Here, I will focus specifically in the case in which the model that we are going to use is a neural network, so the model that I have introduced previously. So why this is very general, the literature is very general, and there are applications in many fields in statistics and machine learning? Because every time you want to optimize some function, which is a function of a probability distribution, or a function of the parameters of a probability distribution, you can think about using the previous framework, which you suppose that the geometry not to be Euclidean. And um, so this happens, for example, every time you maximize some likelihood, every time you optimize some expected value. So the literature and the, the number of possible applications is very large. Um, there are also some advantages in using the method that I mentioned, and the biggest one is the fact that you have invariance to the choice of the parameterization. I already uh, I mentioned this at the beginning, but I want to stress this here, because every time you are in this setting in which the choice of the parameters, uh, I mean, you have to, of course, represent your probability distribution. So if you use a parametric approach, you will have some parameters which describe your probability distribution. Once you compute um, vector or partial derivative, the direction de depends on the choice of the parameterization. While using an approach based on Riemannian geometry, by taking into account uh, um, different possible uh, way to represent your metric uh, tensor based on the choice of, of the chart, you obtain invariance. So independently from the choice of the parameterization, the behavior of the algorithm will be the same. And this is very important, because we don't know a priori if one parameterization has to be better than another one. Yes? Uh, so, when I introduce here, so if you want to have invariance, sorry, so of course now we have two different schemes. One scheme is gradient descent in which you have a step size, and here you, in this situation you need to have the exponential map to guarantee invariance, otherwise for different step size you would have a different behavior. Or you can think about the differential equation of the flow that you would have if in each point you follow the uh, direction given by the derivative uh, of the gradient in the point. Then in that case, you don't care about uh, the step size. And so if you compute the, the gradient with respect to Riemannian approach, the flows will be different. Yeah, I think the question refers to the next slide. Ah, sorry. No, the slide you were on. Ah, OK. Wait. Ah, uh, uh, okay. So in this, okay, okay, I understand now. So here they ignore 
the problem of the computation of the fraction. So this was uh, uh, like here. Further? Here? Further again? Okay, here, sorry. Yeah. So here, the problem of the retraction is ignored. And um, um, so you don't really have uh, an exact invariance because you would need to compute it. But there are situations in which, uh, uh, for very small step size, you do approximation and you say that you don't really need to, to compute it. So of course, there is a trade-off between the problem of invariance and the problem of the computation of the retraction, because the computation of retraction in general is something which is, uh, uh, is difficult to compute. So for example, uh, either, I mean, for some specific uh, manifold, you have closed formula solution. For some other, you don't. So in general, you need to solve a differential equation. There are situations in which you explicitly have a formula which is computationally intractable. But in the case of uh, uh, neural networks, you don't have this case. So you have to find some approximation in order to uh, replace the operator that you would like to plug in with uh, like the, the, the true, let's say, operator associated to the exponential map. So I have to say that uh, um, surprising the literature of um, uh, so the literature of Riemannian optimization is well developed. We have a lot of papers, we have a lot of books. The literature of a specific case in which the manifold is a statistical model so from the perspective of optimization is not so developed in the sense that we have a smaller number of papers and, and there is also a lot of research which is going in the direction of, okay, I have to solve this problem, how do I do this in the, in the best way? And how do I approximate my quantities such that I have something which is efficient, can be computed efficiently, and and it's something between the real invariant direction operator that I would have and just the plain computation of the gradient. So just to give you an idea, also here we have some st stochasticity related to the fact that we don't compute exactly our empirical, our expected risk, but we base an estimation of the risk on the sample that we have which means that our algorithm will be very stochastic and will depend on the observation that we have. So also the fact that you do approximation is uh, intrinsically in the type of problem you want to solve. It's not like a, a pure optimization problem as you would do in control, but it's a problem in which you deal with data and the data that are visible to you somehow give you a bias in what you do and the approximation you do in during your inference. Yes? But the principle of course is right. If your lambda is big, you might get out of your chart. Yes. Yes, right. So there is also another point here. There is also another point here that it also depends on the domain of your, of your parameters. So there are situations in which uh, you really have to take into account the fact that maybe you are updating your parameters in a direction in which uh, you don't have any more a parameter which describes properly your manifold, right? So if you think about uh, the sphere, you need to renormalize your data somehow to project back to the surface of the sphere. So also depends on the geometry of the space of the, of the parameter, so on the chart. In particular, if we suppose that our chart are in Rn, so the parameters are in Rn, then we don't have the issue of being in a point which is outside, but still is not the right way that we should do for if you want to be completely invariant and have exactly the same uh, behavior of the algorithm independently from the choice of the step size. Sorry, can you repeat? Yes, so we are in this context. So you you can by computing third derivative, not only second one to a geometry, you get the sense of connection that will give you flat intrinsic connection to make a translation. Um so I'm not sure. So for this operator here, we don't need a connection. But maybe you are saying that the connection is related to the exponential map. OK, so maybe we need to talk, because I need to understand better what you mean. But you will be very happy. Yes. Yes. Oh, sorry. 
yeah, I will introduce this in the next slide to see how you do this when you have to, 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 to deal with the statistical model. So I will only five minutes and then I will be done. Uh, maybe less. So, uh, okay, so again, right, here, if I, you want to do things properly, you would need to introduce the exponential map. So how we define the joint probability distribution? That's the point of the question, right? So of course, uh, we need to model, we need to do some probability distribution because uh, uh, we have to have objects which are in the space of probability distribution. And this may not be clear for the different models that I have introduced previously. So I mentioned three models. I mentioned the Boltzmann machine, I mentioned problems for binary classification and problems for regression. So how do you approach this? Well, you do this in different ways. So in the case of the Boltzmann machine, well, this is uh, somehow uh, given by the type of model that we use. So we introduce explicitly a probability distribution by having the energy function you consider and considering the Boltzmann distribution. So the geometry that we have here is the geometry of uh, the exponential map in which the weights corresponds, for example, to the uh, natural parameters of an exponential family. So it's clear for this type of generative model the correspondence between the weights and the model itself. So the weights are the natural parameters of the exponential family. For feedforward network, it's a little bit different in the sense that if here we only have a probability distribution either over the, the visible and observed, and then we do some mar marginalization operator. In the case of feedforward network, we have different models. Uh, we have in particular a joint probability distribution in the case of a binary classification in which uh, we cannot control the distribution of the x because we have samples which are given to us and we have a conditional distribution which is encoded by the network. So in practice, we want the network to output for a binary classification problem the probability of one sample to be zero, to have a label zero or a label one. So the network itself will represent this conditional probability distribution in the sense that the output will be uh, the probability. And so we can explicitly write the joint probability distribution using this formula here. Then what about uh, uh, the case of regression problem? Well, here the geometry is a function of the noise assumption that we do. So if we suppose, for example, that the true labels are uh, given by some model that we don't know and that we try to approximate with a, a deterministic neural network plus some noise, well, we can do some hypothesis on the noise, for example, to be Gaussian and to be well distributed, and then we will have a probability distribution for the difference between Y and F. And using by some assumption and dependence, we can say that uh, the distribution of the y given x will be distributed with some uh, uh, Gaussian distribution. For example, if you do assumption of Gaussian noise centered around f with some covariance around it. So this gives another way to compute uh, the joint probability distribution as a function of uh, the data that we cannot control. These are given to us and uh, the model itself. And then the next step will be the computation of the Fisher matrix, which uh, by definition is the expected value of the derivative of the log probabilities. And you just take this expected value, you replace the probability distribution, the joint probability distribution that we have computed in the previous slides. And in the work of Amari, you see explicit formula for the computation of the Fisher matrix in the case of a regression problem, or for example, in the case of a um, uh, a binary classification problem, which can be easily extended to multi-class and to multi-attribute uh, settings. So we need to map the neural network to the space of probability distribution. And we do this by saying that uh, the map, the ne neural network acts as a conditional probability distribution by fixing the input. And once we have the joint probability distribution, which depends on the weights of the network, we can write the Fisher information matrix by computing the derivative, the partial derivative of the log probabilities. And just plugging in the formula, you obtain what you have here. OK, so, um, so of course, now we, we have a parallelism between the two. We know which are the tools that we should uh, use in order to make our algorithm invariant to parameterization. And uh, we would like to see what are the advantages of these techniques. So uh, these techniques have, as I said, the two advantages. One is about uh, the fact that you don't specifically depend on the choice of the parameterization. And the second one is based on the fact that uh, you uh, control some uh, 
deformation of the space, which is not given by the space itself, but is given by the way in which you represent the space. So this is the typical case that you have here when I plotted the probability distribution. So you see that you have a deformation of the space, which are just a consequence of the way you decided to parameterize. So you see this deformation in the space of the parameters, but it's just like the metric itself that will compensate for that by taking the inverse of it when you compute the gradient. Of course, this formula that we have here are extremely uh, computationally expensive to be computed because the dimension of this uh, matrix is here is the number of parameters of your model times the number of parameters which have to be inverted. And so the literature is about finding efficient way to do this inversion by doing some uh, uh, extra hypothesis on the uh, conditional independence between the weights in your model, or by uh, explicitly use some uh, uh, rewriting of them which depends on uh, the model itself. Consider also that these quantities are computed and are estimated from the samples, which still introduce some other noise in your model, and so uh, in the end we also work with approximation of the true quantities. I want to conclude the slides by reporting some experimental results in the literature. One is about the work of Amari and co-workers in 2000, which was the first application of this method in which you see that, for a very small data set, by the way, in which you see that basically you have a speed up in the convergence when you compute these uh, quantities with respect to uh, the geometry given by the divergence in this case. And in particular, you, have, you are less prone to the presence of, uh, of a plateau. And, and then a more recent uh, paper in 2014 in which this has been applied to um, uh, autoencoders, in which you have like uh, this plot here in terms of the iteration, in which the method based on this quadratic, um, I mean this method based on the computation of the Fisher information matrix are faster to converge in terms of iteration. But once you move to the space in which the x-axis becomes the time, you see what I mentioned in the beginning. So here, maybe we converge, and we see that we converge in a smaller number of steps, but we take more time to compute each step. So now the point is to find the right trade-off between the computation of each single iteration, which in general would require you to solve a linear system, and uh, like the number of iterations. So this is somehow similar to what you would have with second order method when you take somehow uh, into account information about the addition of your function, in which you have faster convergence, but the method takes more time because you have to compute uh, second order information. So here I have like a set of references for uh, the application of uh, Riemannian method in the specific case of uh, a manifold of probability distribution in the field of neural network. You see the work of Amari like uh, um, almost 20 years ago, and now more recent work which has been done in, in the literature on these topics in the last couple of years, and also application in other fields of uh, machine learning where you uh, have to optimize quantities which depends on uh, uh, probability distribution. Okay, so uh, I conclude my talk here. The idea is that uh, um, the geometry of statistical model not only is very interesting from a more mathematical perspective in the sense that you have a very nice and uh, um, very uh, interesting construction in which you use the language of the geometry to describe the language of uh, object in the in statistics, let's say, but it's also interesting from the perspective of application, particularly in machine learning and optimization, once you want to explicitly take into account the geometry of the space, for example, through the computation of uh, the gradient and Riemannian gradient. The, uh, of course, you have like uh, some uh, better performance in terms of uh, uh, number of iteration, but you have a trade-off with respect to the, uh, the efficiency of computing this object. And uh, in some cases, uh, this uh, gap is very large. In some other cases, it's not. It depends on the application. So in particularly, in the field of stochastic station here, when you do optimization of black box derivative, you see that the general formula in which you have to compute the inverse of a function becomes extremely easy because of some simplification that you do. And so in some problems, you don't have to compute the inverse of the matrix. It depends on the specific application. So some fields uh, is more efficient, some other field is less, and the research is uh, trying to find the right approximation and the right parameterization, which gives you formula for Riemannian gradients, which are efficiently com uh, computationally efficient. And also another field of interest, which is uh, something that uh, is of extreme interest for me, is how you generalize the second order model method to uh, 
to the optimization in the sense that uh, what I've described is a first order method because you computed the gradient, but also if you want to do second order approximation, you would need to take into account then the structure given by the connection for the computation of the action. And so the math involved is like, uh, is deeper and you need to have like uh, uh, more construction related to that. Okay, I conclude here my talk. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Uh, this is uh, one remark. Uh, recently, last year, uh, Yann Olivier on mm -hmm. uh, Gaëtan Marceau Caron. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so they have made some tests uh, for natural uh, natural gradients. Mm -hmm. But when the, the space of parameter is very large, mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, the problem is to how to estimate the, the Fisher matrix and to inverse it uh, rob in a robust way. Mm -hmm. uh, so. They prove that it's not robust. So they, they, they have proposed uh, what they call practical uh, Riemannian neural network. Mm -hmm. well, uh, they have a method to, to robustify the natural gradient. And, and, and more recently, they have published uh, for GSI in November, mm -hmm. they, they have published a, a paper which is uh, what they call natural Langevin dynamics. Mm -hmm. The idea is to, to mix the stochastic uh, gradient based on Langevin equation with natural uh, gradient. So you can uh, benefit of uh, both uh, uh, properties of the, these two gradient, to have the natural gradient to be independent of parametrization, and to have a stochastic uh, based on the uh, Langevin uh, equation uh, for stochastic approach. Do, do you test uh, this, this natural, uh, natural gradient on uh, uh, in space of parameter with a very high dimension. So the problem is exactly what you mean. You cannot do this uh, just taking the formula and plugging the formula. You need to find a smart approximation. You need to do some assumption. You need to force conditional independence in order to have uh, some structure which are computationally tractable. And that's exactly what is the research about in the last year, two years, trying to find approximation which guarantees the fact that you can apply this in very large model because we're talking about space of the parameters which can be easily uh, larger than 100K or 200K or even million of parameters. So you need to have approximation. That's the general theory that in the case of uh, uh, neural networks can, cannot be applied directly. But the point is what is the best trade-off in order to have a faster convergence while keeping computationally efficient uh, uh, approach, a computationally efficient method, let's say. On the last remark, yeah, uh, also the one tendency, is uh, one trend uh, in this topic is uh, the DARPA has recently launched uh, a study which is called uh, XA Artificial Intelligence, mm -hmm. X for explainable. So the problem for some industrial applications is that it is a black box. So it's very difficult to, to qualify uh, these, uh, these uh, tools for um, uh, industrial applications. Uh, and it is more and more in competition with uh, decision trees on uh, random forest. And uh, recently, uh, Gérard Bio from uh, UPMC in Paris, they, they have a paper what they call Neural Random Forest. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that when you have learned your network, you can transform it in a decision trees, mm -hmm. which, which is more explainable. Uh, so less, uh, less black box for uh, industrial application. On the mix between neural networks and uh, decision trees. So this is a general problem of neural networks. So in general problem of black box models. So uh, the point is, uh, if in your application you can trust the fact that you have something which maybe gives you very good performance, but you cannot understand what is behind and how the decision is made. So in some fields uh, this is okay. Like if you do a classification of faces for uh, some kind of social network, there's no problem about that. Some of the fields in uh, finance or maybe in uh, uh, medical application, it depends on the approach that you want to use and depends on the literature. And uh, in general, um, in some fields, you cannot do that because people want to know why this is happening. But in general, we cannot ignore the fact that this method gives you very high performance. So the problem is that you may have very high performance with a tool that maybe will support the decision of an expert, but is not able to explain you why. 
or you can use other tools which are not, maybe not able to compete with the state of the art. It depends on the field, it depends on the approach. So I don't think there is a, it is an open problem, the fact that you don't know what is happening, but uh, um, also you don't know what is happening in the brain, right? The problem is that uh, you don't know uh, how, uh, I mean, this method are not able to explain why they make some decision. That's the difference. And uh, you would like, I mean, there's some research of networks which are able to somehow uh, output also the process which, like a description comprehensible to human why they came to the decision. But uh, this is like very recent work and uh, I don't know much about that. Thank you. Just a, re a remark on this point about the brain. There is this uh, proposition of Carl Friston, for example, that in fact, uh, starting from this kind of problem, what does the brain is to construct like a, a, a better function? It is a, to, to, to replace global computation by local computation okay? and obtaining minimum which are not far from the good one. Okay, I, I don't you know. know thanks. You know, this very nice proposition he was science uh, 10 years, Carl Friston. Okay, okay. okay thanks. So the way I understood it, you obtain the probabilistic model over the weights by pulling uncertainty back from your loss function. Mm -hmm. um, do you have an understanding for whether pulling it back in this way helps you reach a less uncertain uh, solution in the end in, in a better way than other ways of doing, of, I mean, other manifolds, other gradients, Yeah, so I didn't mention, so the talk was about uh, different geometries, so this is not the only approach. You could no, so do, the question like, is really, how do you know this is Well, I don't think there is an way easy way to, to say define. a priori <laughs> what's the best geometry. I mean, Poincaré says it depends on the context, right? So that's why I started my talk with that sentence. There is, in my opinion, there is no the way to go. It's interesting to see what are the different approaches. So, for example, uh, people in this like, couple of days mentioned Wasserstein geometry. So you could have like construction of information geometry based on the Wasserstein geometry. Or you could do something completely different, which is another like field <coughs> that I didn't mention, which is about the use of Riemannian method for neural networks, in which uh, you don't rely on a construction of the geometry of statistical models, as you do in information geometry, but you rely on some hypothesis in the space of the parameters. So it didn't constrain the space of the weights, but you may say that uh, in order to have like, since you have like invariances in this space, for example, you may say that uh, the weights are on the surface of a sphere. And then uh, the Riemannian structure does not require a probabilistic interpretation, but is uh, a Riemannian structure that you have because of some invariance properties of the network itself, maybe because of some operators that you have. This is like a different line of research, which is extremely interesting, which uses Riemannian method, but in a different context. So what, what is the, the right one? I don't think there is like the, I mean, these are like different hypotheses, different approach that you do. Um, in the context of statistical model, in my opinion, there are advantages using this type of construction because of the invariance with respect to parameterization. But every time your method provides you some kind of invariance, in my opinion, this is something that is interesting and is, uh, uh, should be like explored because the problem of the invariance is what is motivating, in my opinion, this type of is one of the motivation for this type of application in machine learning. Yeah, but in fact, you could have a lot of different invariants because you you are fitting a function, so you could say. Um, Optimizing in space of function, I can think about, you know, when you do regression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I only cover the... Thinking about the way you move in this manifold. So, so it's clear that there is a large uh, range of different metrics you can use. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. Um... And it seems there is something which is not completely clear about this. When we focus on this uh, uh, Fisher information, mm -hmm. I think it makes sense if really we think that we have a target that can be really well estimated in terms of probability, and so we will move in a space of probability, and we want to move to the target following some well, natural this is a, metric for that space. This but. is a problem of model selection. If you believe that your model is approximating well the, the quantity that you want to estimate or not. Um, you have interpretation in terms of uh, projection and KL divergence uh, in this context here, but uh, of course the problem of the choice of the model, you always have this problem, independently from the fact that you use information geometry or you don't. 
But yes, I agree with you that the uh, Riemannian method can be applied in this context and in machine learning from different perspectives, not only from geometric perspective. More questions? And then let's thank the speaker again. I have a, a, marketing, a marketing slide, so if you are interested in these topics, so I have like a research project which is strictly related to what I've been talking during my presentation. We have at least one postdoc position, so if you know somebody that could be interested in working on this, just let me know, send me an email, and I will be very happy to talk about that. Thank you.